Everyone that exalted himself shall be humbled, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, in the Gospel of the Tenth Sunday after Pentecost, our blessed Lord pictures the virtue of true humility in the person of this publican who does not even dare to look up to God but acknowledges his true state of life, namely that he is a sinner and he only has one request, that God forgives him his sins. Since true humility is nothing else than truth, and in truth we are all before God sinners. And this is what we admire in the saints. The saints, you can look at every saint you want, which we celebrate during the year. Every saint manifested this truth, that he considered himself before God as he is, namely as a sinner who needs the forgiveness of God and his grace. Otherwise, he would be no saint at all. And one saint who manifested this great virtue, namely the virtue of humility, is next to the Blessed Virgin Mary, her own mother, Saint Anne, whose feast we celebrated just this past week. And we would like to speak a little bit and to think a little bit about St. Anne today. St. Anne undoubtedly is a great, great saint. But she is not a saint because she gave birth to our Blessed Lady. St. Anne is not a saint simply because she gave birth to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Someone does not just go to heaven simply because he's related or she is related to our Lord or Lady. In application, someone does not just simply go to heaven, saves his immortal soul because he attends the traditional Mass, receives from time to time the sacraments. It requires much more to save one's immortal soul. And this is exactly what our Lord meant when he corrected the woman who praised his mother. And we read this gospel uh, on many Saturdays which are dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he says that it came to pass, as he spoke these things, a certain woman from the crowd, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the babs that gave thee suck. But he said, Ye rather blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. This word of our blessed Lord many times, is used in an incorrect way as whether our blessed Lord would have lowered by his own words the dignity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The exact opposite is true. He elevated the dignity of the Blessed Virgin Mary by her own words. Our Lord was not rebuking the woman for the praise of his mother, but he was correcting her. 
He was saying effectively, my mother is not blessed because she gave birth to me and nursed me, brought me up and so forth. But because she heard the word of God and kept it, as this said twice in the Gospels, that the Blessed Virgin Mary would keep the word in her heart and pound on it. For any woman, even a sinful woman, could have given birth to our Blessed Lord if it would have been according to the plan of Divine Providence. He could have taken his human nature from any woman at all, if he wanted to do so. And our Lord, furthermore, had many relatives. But it is recorded that they refused to believe in him, his own relatives. And they were not sanctified simply because they were related to our blessed Lord. The Blessed Virgin Mary heard the word of God better than anyone else. For she heard the angel Gabriel speaking to her at the announcement of the Incarnation. When the angel Gabriel came down from heaven, announced to her this marvelous and wonderful plan of God's redemptive love, that he himself, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who shares the same divine nature as the Father and the Holy Ghost, would find a way to reunite to himself the two natures, namely the divine and the human, and becomes therefore in the incarna incarnation the eternal high priest in order to operate the redemption of mankind. And she, the Blessed Virgin Mary, was not just a listener to the Word of God, as we are at times, but she kept the Word of God spoken to her better than anyone, because by her humble consent, through deep faith and love of God, she not only conceived the word of God in her mind, and that's what we do when we, when we hear the word of God. We conceive it in our mind, we make it our own in our mind. But she truly conceived the eternal word of God, that is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Son of God, in her womb at the moment of the Incarnation. And our ascent of the truth of the Catholic faith is therefore and must be an imitation of Our Lady's consent to the Annunciation of the Incarnation. And our faith is very, very different from any other concept of faith of other religion, especially the Protestant concept and the capping of the Protestant concept of faith by the modernists. The concept, the Catholic concept of faith is essentially different. It means nothing else than the bowing of our sometimes very prideful intellect in accepting everything, everything God has revealed to us, either in sacred scripture and tradition, and proposed by us, to us, by the Roman Catholic Church as such. That is the Catholic faith. 
it is an intellectual acceptance of all the truth God has revealed. And if we do so, we imitate the consent of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the moment of the Incarnation. And our supernatural virtue of faith, the first supernatural virtue of faith, which we receive at the day of our baptism, which is in a way the word of God living in our mind, is it not, is an imitation of the conception of the eternal word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the real reason why St. Anne is a saint, and such a great saint, and such a great example, ex especially for the mothers, for the women, is that she is a saint since she raised the Blessed Virgin Mary to such high perfection and holiness that she, the Blessed Virgin Mary, became an apt, a fitting, yes, a worthy vessel to be the mother of God. And although it is true God could have chosen any woman if he wanted to do so, even a sinner to be his mother. But it was not fitting to do so. It was fitting that his mother would be the most holy person possible. It was fitting that the house upon earth in which he would dwell in which he himself built, that's why we call it the mystical city of God, should be a perfect house, a perfect city, indeed a highly decorated palace of sanctifying grace and all the virtues. And only seldom will God do things suddenly. And I wish we would understand this and ponder on this very deeply. And so, therefore, when we consider our terrible times in which we live, this great apostasy, these many errors in, in the conciliar church and in society in the world, we must not expect a sudden intervention of God that is not God's ordinary ways of acting. Sometimes, and only sometimes, he acts suddenly. We can think of the conversion of St. Paul, when a sinner, yes, a bloody persecutor of the church, was turned suddenly by the grace of God into a great saint and apostle. The other rare cases of sudden conversions in the history of the church, but the normal, ordinary way of God is to accomplish his work slowly, in a sense, naturally and gradually. So it is quite normal, quite ordinary that the great saints came from very pious homes and parents. Very seldom we hear of saints whose parents were worldly or great sinners. We think of, we think of the great Saint Monica, the mother of Saint Augustine. We think of the holy mother of Saint John Bosco. We think of the holy mother of Pope Pius X and so forth. And in like manner, God prepared the great place of sanctity, the Blessed Virgin Mary, not by a sudden conversion, but by means of very pious parents, a very pious and holy home that was dominated by St. Joachim 
in Bayes and Ain. We know very, very little about them, at least what sacred scripture concerns. We know much more about them from the writings of the mystics. But what we know, besides the mystics, we know from tradition, which is one source of revelation, and from reason. For if our lady achieved this height of purity and sanctity, so that she was found suitable to be the mother of God, that's why we call her a worthy mother of God, we must assume that her training, that is her upbringing, in piety and discipline, which she learned from St. Anne before she turned into the temple, must have been very exceptional and perfect. It is certain without doubt that it is God who builds the house of sanctity by giving grace. But it's also true that we can place obstacles to the grace of God through sin. Normally speaking, the ordinary way how God operates is, as the theologians would tell us, through secondary causes. That is to say, creatures which he uses as instruments. God, meaning the ultimate first cause of everything, but he in his divine providence likes to use secondary causes, instruments through which he directs us. And therefore, good Catholic parents are given to us in order to impart to us discipline so that we do not place these obstacles with grace of God. That is the holy obligation given to parents that they try to remove these obstacles to the, to, to the grace of God of God. And a part of the degree of divine providence of predestination, that is the Catholic understanding of the predestination, which is the pre-planning from God, very different from the erroneous heretical predestination of Calvin, namely the predestination to heavenly glory is the home and are the parents in which we are born in the training and the upbringing which we receive in that home. And God, as, as already said, works normally according to these methods of his divine providence. Only very rarely does he grant graces of conversions to those who have been raised in houses of sin. But one of the most remarkable aspects of sin then is that we know almost nothing about her as revelation concerns. She is a saint, good and great sin, and because she did her obligations according to her state of life. She walked quietly in obscurity. And that is the way of God. That is the way of our sanctification. That by fulfilling almost scrupulously 
our obligation of our state of life, we will sanctify ourselves. And when it comes to a father and a mother, if they fulfill very faithfully their obligation of state of life, that can mean sometimes a very heroic degree of virtue. And if you do so, you imitate what St. Anne did. She lived from day to day without notable events in her life except the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary in older age, trying to keep the flame of her faith and the flame of her love of God burning in her own soul, in the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She did the menial tasks of her household duties in all humility and discretion. She simply did her obligations, but with such perfection of love, of God in your soul, that she has merited to be raised to the altars of God and be venerated as a saint. And so we too must quietly and humbly do our obligations of our own state of life like Saint Anne. That is the ordinary way of our sanctification. And in these times in which we live, in which we are deprived of a true Catholic voice, named the voice of a true Pope, a true Vicar of Christ, there are so many Catholics who look for extraordinary signs of God's presence or for apocalyptic events, God intervening. Every year, people think that way. They busy themselves constantly to look at the news, whether there is some sort of intervention, apocalyptic intervention of God, which may point the way in this darkness. But there's already a problem in this way of thinking, since, in fact, there should be no darkness whatsoever in us, since we have, as we always say, the Catholic faith. And since our duty should be clear, that is, to maintain in profess the Catholic faith as has been given to us by our forefathers and to resist the heretics of our own times at all costs, that is to say, having nothing but nothing to do with the modernists of our own days and therefore not to compromise our holy Catholic faith. Remember, and we should think deeply about this, St. Anne and Our Lady lived in a time when Israel had not seen a prophet for 300 years. And of course God arranged this in his divine providence and purpose. But he did not want to confuse the appearance of his only begotten son, the true Messiah, with any prophet except St. John the Baptist who actually were pointing to him. The very long line in the Old Testament of the prophet ceased. The voice of God to the prophet ceased 300 years before the coming of Christ. So for three centuries, there had not been any extraordinary event. But St. Anne, 
is a saint. Because she continued to believe very faithfully and to practice the old faith as a true Israelite, unlike the leaders of the chosen people who became very worldly. And we know from the fact that most of the Jews rejected our Lord. That the greater part of the Jews were neither believing nor very pious at the time of our blessed Lord. Only a small number, if you really think about it, only a small number were faithful and therefore were true Israelites. And these are the one who accepted our Lord as the true Messiah. And likewise in our own times, we are deprived of a living magisterium. We are deprived of a true voice, of a true book of Christ. And we are deprived, at least until now, of God's extraordinary interventions. Also remember, when it comes to the expectation of the intervention of God, we many times believe not that God already intervened, and he intervened in anticipation, as I have explained it so many times, by the request to the king of France in the 17th century to consecrate the nation of France to the sacred heart of Jesus. And by doing so, the sacred heart of Jesus would protect France. The king denied this request delivered by St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and therefore, according to the prophecy of the sacred heart, would have to bear the punishment thereof, which happened 100 years later by the French Revolution. The same happened at the apparition of Our Lady of Lourdes, the popes did not listen to the warnings of the Blessed Virgin Mary, especially for the consecration of Russia and the public act of reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary and therefore had to bear the consequences which were shown by the losing of the papacy to the Roman Catholic Church. So God, as he always does, already intervened in anticipation, but his way of intervening is very different from our way he should intervene. But regardless, we have the Catholic faith, which is so very clearly defined. And we have still the means of sanctification, thank God, like the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Especially in this city, you have so many places where the holy sacrifice of the Mass is offered. Many faithful think it is a negative, in fact it is a positive. The faith is clear, our sanctification is clear, like since Ains consists in remaining faithful to the old law and observing God's eternal laws. And therefore, we should also learn from St. Ain how to organize our homes. When two people planning to get married, it is extremely important that they consider how to organize the interior 
of their lives and their homes. Our Lady grew up in a home of faith and love of God. So also parents today must make for their children a home of deep faith and of love of God and of neighbor, but they must do so with cheerfulness. This task is definitely very difficult, since the modern world of ours is characterized, whether you like it or not, by unbelief and contempt for the law of God. And if families cannot find faith and love of God in the world, and certainly they cannot, or with great difficulty, they must establish it first in their own souls. First of all, and no less importantly, in their homes. Parents must teach the children this old and to do very obsolete virtues of obedience, respect, discipline, chastity, purity, and the hard, hard virtue of hard work. They must teach the children to have a life of prayer, not so much by words, but more so by deeds and example. It's much more effective. They must teach them that the ultimate life, the ultimate purpose of this life, is to see God in heaven. And they must carry the cross in this life in order to see God in the next. That is the order of God, that's our state of life after the fall of Adam. That we have to carry our crosses. And all those virtues which are just narrated are difficult to practice in a world who has absolute disdain for those old virtues. Finally, to come to inclusion, we should not forget that St. Anne is to us our grandmother of heaven since the Blessed Virgin Mary is our heavenly mother. And therefore, grandparents and old people in general deserve our special respect. It is also something which in this society of ours is totally obsolete, the respect for elderly people. They serve our special respect because of their years of faithful service and their years of wisdom. Grandparents today should especially be witnesses to their children and grandchildren of the holy Catholic faith in which they were raised and should give a good example of rejecting totally this new religion which came from Vatican II and of continuing the traditional faith the faith of all times of our ancestors. May therefore the Catholic faith pass from generation to generation unchanged. And why has it to be unchanged? The Catholic faith teaches us doctrines, mysteries, which are true. If it's true, then it must be true in the 3rd century. It must be true in the 6th century. It must be true in the 15th century. And it must be true in the 21st century. Since truth 
is untouched because it's a different order. Truth is untouched by any circumstances of time and therefore in essence, in substance, the true faith must be changed, must be unchanged and must pass from generation to generation as the true faith of the Old Testament was preserved in the soul of St. Anne and carefully transmitted to the immaculate soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let us learn from St. Anne this constancy in the faith and in the practice of our holy Catholic faith. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.